The National Desk, America's News, now. This week's horrific attack on the world's central kitchen was not the first such incident. It must be the last. President Biden gives Netanyahu an ultimatum. Could Israeli missteps lead to the end of the war? And it is winter wonderland, the one that no one was expecting. Who's getting pummeled the hardest by winter's encore performance? And when we can expect this spring nor'easter to loosen its grip? The push for electric vehicles takes a hit as one major car maker delays production on EV models. The administration's response to a slowing EV market. This is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Amira David. And as we come on the air, an April nor'easter battering parts of New England in the second week of spring. Tens of millions of you out there in the path of severe weather. Rain and sleet turning into heavy and wet snow coupled with strong and gusty winds. And we have snow falling down right now. And when it comes to New Hampshire, they're seeing it fall at a rate of one to two inches per hour. Maine and Vermont also getting slammed at the moment, the region expecting up to two feet of snow in certain spots. That storm knocking out power in its path. Poweroutage.us reporting more than 600,000 customers right now without power across the Northeast. Half of those, half of those, over 300,000 of them just in Maine alone. And the somewhat long-lasting storm that we're seeing happen over the course of the week. It began on Wednesday in the Northeast. It won't finally wind down until Friday night or Saturday for certain parts of New Hampshire. And it's not just about the east. Crews cleaning up after more than a foot of snow fell across the Midwest tonight in parts of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Ohio. A flood warning in effect from heavy rain in other parts of the region. Drier conditions are expected overnight. And stay with us as we track the developments on this far-reaching storm throughout the night. You can join us both on air and online at thenationaldesk.com. In a much anticipated phone call, President Joe Biden told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today that Israel must do more to reduce civilian suffering in Gaza, both by taking steps to ensure non-combatants, especially aid workers, are not at risk and that more needs to be done to allow aid into Gaza. Biden made clear, according to the readout of their call, the United States policy towards Gaza depends on Israel's immediate action on these steps, but spokesperson John Kirby said it's too early to dictate what the next phase looks like. I'm not going to preview steps. I'm not going to preview decisions that haven't been made yet, but um, there are things that need to be done. There are too many civilians being killed. The risk to aid workers is unacceptable. So there has to be tangible steps. Let's see what they announce. Let's see what they direct. Let's see what they do. Biden also urged the prime minister to conclude a ceasefire deal without delay. Meanwhile, a Hamas official in Lebanon today saying they're, they are no closer to an agreement after rejecting the latest offer, blaming Netanyahu for the roadblocks. Hamas is adamant that any hostage deal must come with a complete end of the war and not just a pause. Israel has repeatedly accepted terms put forward by negotiators only for a temporary end to the fighting. Fulton County Judge Scott McAfee denied a motion to dismiss election interference indictments against Donald Trump and his co-defendants. Legal teams for the defense had argued statements made about the election were protected by the First Amendment. Judge McAfee ruled that even core political speech is not immune from prosecution if it's used for further criminal activity. The trial date has still not yet been set. A judge also denied Trump's request to dismiss his classified documents case today. Trump had argued the documents were considered personal under the Presidential Records Act. U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon said the charges don't reference that law. The trial date has not yet been finalized. Investigators believe there was evidence of foul play in the disappearance of two Oklahoma mothers on Saturday. The State Bureau of Investigation putting out an update based on new information from the victim's car, which was found abandoned near a highway. Jillian Kelly and Veronica Butler were driving to pick up their kids when they went missing. That's according to a source close to Butler. 
And also in the state of Oklahoma, we're just learning the state has executed a man convicted of shooting and killing two people in Oklahoma City back in 2002. Michael Dwayne Smith was put to death by lethal injection this morning. Smith was denied clemency in a recent hearing when he said he was high on drugs but did not commit the crimes. An attorney for one of the victim's family said he's grateful that justice was served. And we're giving you now a live look at St. Louis on the Illinois side of the river, just a few miles away from Ohio, uh, Fallon, uh, Illinois, O'Fallon, Illinois, rather, where 12 students were hospitalized this morning due to a natural gas leak at the St. Clair Catholic grade school. The school was evacuated as emergency officials and hazmat crews searched for the cause of the leak. None of the 12 ill students have life-threatening injuries. Tonight, there are growing concerns about the safety and security of our country. It comes as example, examples are piling up of migrants and criminal backgrounds in the country being released. The National Desk's correspondent, Christine Frizzau, has more. The police found guns, drugs, and... An astonishing revelation about some of the Venezuelan migrants arrested this week with squatters in a Bronx, New York apartment building. Two of them had open criminal cases including one arrested last summer for attempted murder and arrested again a week ago, both times released. Wow. Why do we have our cops put in a very dangerous situation? They shouldn't have been there for that. It should have been handled the first time. Those two people shouldn't have been out in the community. The suspect in the murder of Lake and Riley had also been arrested here in the U.S. and released, despite his crimes and despite authorities knowing he was an undocumented immigrant. Another group of Venezuelan migrants arrested in Texas this week with guns and drugs. And the number of migrants arriving from China is now breaking records from just 342 in 2021 to more than 24,000 in 2023 and already 22,000 just in the first six months of fiscal year 2024. In all of these cases, many now wondering if they had criminal pasts in their home countries. The answer we may never get. When they say vetted, they do not mean that any criminal record was checked in Venezuela of people who they are either releasing or paroling at the border. Same with Cuba. The Cubans don't like us. We've been enemies ever since, what, 1959, since the revolution. So they don't give us information. The Biden administration has insisted the vetting is taking place. Individuals who seek parole under our January 5th program for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans are screened and vetted before they arrive at our border. Here on Capitol Hill, House Republicans have written a letter now demanding answers from the Department of Homeland Security with concerns not only about migrants with criminal backgrounds, but those also with terrorist ties. They say they have still not gotten answers about the extent of the threat from individuals already inside the country. Amira? And Christine, any indication of any changes in the works right now to really address this issue? Not really. I mean, there was, of course, that bipartisan bill to make several changes at the border. But when it comes to countries that we have little or no ties with, these people are still the main groups being brought in under the parole program, uh, with no changes as of now to our relationships with these countries, which means it will be very difficult to send them back there or anywhere, even if they are convicted of crimes. Christine Frizzell, we know you'll stay on top of all the latest when it comes to that issue. Thank you so much. And Los Angeles police and the FBI are investigating one of the biggest cash burglaries in L.A. history. Thieves breaking into a money storage facility in the San Fernando Valley on Sunday, taking up to 30 million dollars. That's according to CNN. Investigators believe it was a sophisticated crew because they avoided getting caught somehow. It's not clear if there are any suspects quite yet. While in Washington state, police are warning homeowners of a new kind of theft threat. There's a common theme here. These were houses that were either for sale or new construction and high end appliances were taken and targeted by these burglars. In one instance, every single appliance was stolen out of the home. So we're talking stove, fridge, microwave. Quite a scheme there, and the police department estimates over $150,000 in losses in Bellevue, Washington alone, and they believe these thefts are going on in the entire region. But officers have made 
one arrest connected to the crimes and are searching for at least two other men who were captured on surveillance video. Coming up, hurricane season starts in less than two months. How many named storms scientists are expecting? Then why doctors and researchers are urging the FDA to revoke its approval of a test to detect opioid addiction risk. And the search continues for a missing Tennessee teen why some neighborhood residents say internet sleuths are becoming invasive. We will be right back. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins has more. Americans appear less and less eager to give up their gas-powered vehicles for electric. Data for the first quarter of 2024 shows electric vehicle sales slowed yet again, even as overall new vehicle sales rose nearly 5%. EV sales grew just 2.7% in the first months of
On Thursday, Ford announcing it's delaying production on all electric, SUV, and pickup trucks, shifting focus to hybrid options. This comes as hybrids increase in popularity. Data from car gurus shows hybrid sales grew nearly five times faster than sales of EVs. You can get a lot of the benefits of an electric vehicle, particularly with a plug-in hybrid, but without kind of the limitations, if you need to go on a longer trip, you still have that internal combustion engine on board. Meanwhile, a massive surplus of Chinese electric vehicles threatens to upend the U.S. EV industry. This week, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in China meeting with officials urging them to slow down production. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Okay, Kayla, thank you. Alaska Air says Boeing paid it around $160 million in the first quarter to start compensating the airline after 737 MAX 9 planes were grounded. The door plug of the MAX 9 flown by Alaska Airlines blew out mid-flight in January, leading to the grounding. The airline says the payment covers lost profits and expects more compensation. 737 MAX jetliner production has dropped in the past few weeks as regulators increase factory checks. The FAA has limited production to 38 jets a month, but the actual output is far below that. Boeing is also slowing down its assembly line to reduce errors that need to be resolved later. Nebraska legislators, they voted down an effort to return Nebraska back to a winner-take-all electoral college state. Donald Trump and state GOP legislators wanted to change how the state awards electoral votes for the general election. Nebraska, along with Maine, currently gives one electoral vote for each voting district. President Joe Biden won one district in 2020, and in a tight electoral race, one point could be the difference in the election. And after spending millions of dollars to recruit a candidate and get on the ballot, the third party organization, No Labels, will not run a third party candidate for a campaign this year. Despite high negatives for both Joe Biden and Donald Trump, the group couldn't find a candidate willing to do the run. The decision to stand down will be welcomed by Democrats who said the centrist effort would actually hurt President Biden, but it may disappoint the voters, hoping to have another option when it comes to the all but certain rematch between Trump and Biden this November. Police and other officials in Zambia are investigating the death of an American woman who was killed by a bull elephant during a safari. The elephant charged the vehicle carrying the victim, 79-year-old Gail Matson. Five other guests and a guide were also along with her this past weekend. The tour company Wilderness said terrain and plants blocked the vehicle so it couldn't drive away fast enough. Matson's remains will be sent to her family in the United States. A group of doctors and researchers are asking the FDA to take back its approval of a genetic test for detecting opioid addic addiction risk. The agency approved the test called AVERT-D in December. It's supposed to be used before someone is prescribed an opioid to help prevent addiction. But some experts, they say the test doesn't work and could lead to over-prescribing. In a setback for ALS treatment, the manufacturer of the drug Relivrio says it is taking its product off the market. The FDA approved the drug back in 2022 despite a lack of evidence that it could help patients because ALS patients have so few treatments. But a large clinical trial shows the drug didn't work better than a placebo. Starting today, no new patients will be able to start the drug and patients already on it can transition to a free drug program. The family of a little boy whose life was saved by a stranger is now raising awareness of the need for living organ donation. Medical reporter Liz Bonas shares how they were given this amazing gift of life. So this is a story about saving little Curtis, who you see here. He was diagnosed with a rare childhood blood cancer and it scarred his liver and left him in need of a liver transplant. And so in January of last year, this little three-year-old, Curtis Binkley, was put on the transplant list for a liver donor. We uh, started praying about it and everything like that, uh, sticking his face and picture in the church bulletin. And, you know, um, and then eventually one day we uh, found out that... Uh, there was somebody on out there. That somebody happened to be Shannon Black, 
She had signed up to be tested as a living liver donor, hoping to give a portion of her liver to her cousin, who also needed a transplant. Sadly, her cousin did not survive. I think if he hadn't had to wait so long, he could have made, made it through. But in that process, guess what? It turned out Shannon's liver was the perfect size and match for little Curtis. Welcome news for a family praying for a miracle. We finally had, you know, hope after just waiting months and months and months. This is little Curtis now. After that successful liver living donor transplant, his family and Shannon met up with us at Cincinnati's Great American Ballpark. A major league game this month supports living liver donation. Without the donations, I'm, I mean, I don't know what we would be doing right now. While Shannon is sad about her own family's loss, she says every donor moves someone else up the list. I think it's just a really important um, life-changing thing. Reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering the issues that matter most to you. We're taking the pulse of America. These stairs used to lead to a mid-sized home, but that was before the property became a squatter battleground. We had to put locks on our water, locks on our plug-in. Last year, our cameras captured that house before it was torn down. Missionary Baptist Church next door says the squatters living there were stealing their power. Several of our saw a wire coming from the house. And ran it to our box on the pole across the street. And here you see that cable running from the church to the home. We rode along with Constable Catherine Brown and her deputies as they checked on that property today. They walked us through how these cases typically work. And we give a warning, put posted on the front door or on the front gate, if not able to get to the front door, giving them notice that we're coming in uh, on that day. Back at her station, we asked Brown the question many of you have been asking. How concerned should people be about squatting? It's getting pretty common, especially after COVID, when a lot of individuals lost their place of residence. 
The search continues for missing Tennessee teen Sebastian Rogers, and it's not getting any easier. A father who lives in the neighborhood says it's been a difficult time for the community, but it's also been very invasive. People have been coming in um, almost daily, and they've had to report them to the sheriff's department. They've come in uh, TikTokers that are uh, nationally known, trying to get pictures of the family and so on, that they've been flying drones over houses. An independent volunteer says her group's goal is to keep Sebastian's name and face public so they can all work together to bring him home back to his family. An ongoing debate over a seawall on Isle of Palms. My whole motivation is this, that I believe that every American has a right to protect their property. We first met Rum Reddy in February when he was building a seawall to protect his property. But since then, he has faced obstacles and pushback with city and state leaders. Now, another organization is getting involved. Essentially, our motion is to intervene in this case to support DHEC um, in seeking permanent removal of the structure. Um, to remove it from that critical area. Emily Sedzo with the Coastal Conservation League says Reddy's protective seawall could actually harm the environment. So really while a seawall might protect something that is landward of it or behind it, it comes at the expense of the beach. Coming up, the oldest man in the world has died. How long he lived and what he wanted to be remembered for. The oldest man in the world has died. Juan Vicente Perez Mora was 114 years old, holding the Guinness World Record since the year 2022. He was the fourth confirmed oldest living person in the world. He was born on May 27th, 1909 in Venezuela, so he was just shy of turning 115. He said he wants to be remembered as hardworking and faithful. What a remarkable life lived. That does it for this edition of the National Desk. Thank you so much for joining us.